Welcome travelers to Adventures in Myth and History. This is the second in a series of two videos that look at how and why the pilgrims came to North America and how they fared during the first year. Our story is based on the writings of Pilgrim's longtime governor and Mayflower passenger William Bradford and writing in Mort's Relation, a history of the Plymouth Plantation written largely by Edward Winslow, with some of the beginning pages written by William Bradford. Both primary sources are listed in the bibliography, available in the video study guide and script, with a link in the video description. Our story begins where my last video left off, with the landing of the Pilgrims and the Strangers at Plymouth. No, no rock. To review, the occupants of the Mayflower were not all Puritan separatists. Separatists we now call Pilgrims. Instead, only about half of the passengers were separatists, with the remaining passengers made up of non-Puritans known as Strangers. Because of this mix, I refer to the landing party as the Settlers. Also, a reminder that Plymouth was a plantation. A plantation in the early days of the colonies was a settlement that was granted a patent by the English crown, a patent that described the rights, responsibilities, and expectations for the settlement. The settlers faced an unknown world, a hideous and desolate wilderness full of wild beasts, according to Bradford. Further, the settlers had arrived in the winter, a winter known as one of the coldest on record. There was also sickness aboard the Mayflower, largely due to delays in their voyage, delays I described in the first video. Weather continued to hinder any attempts to build a settlement. According to Mort's relation, Frost and foul weather hindered us much, this time of the year, seldom would we work half the week. While many of the settlers continued living on the Mayflower, Others began building a few small cottages by January 9th on lots assigned by lot. Each lot size was based on the number of people who would live on it, allocating one-half pole width and three poles length for each person, which converts to eight and a quarter feet by 49 and a half feet for each person. Each man was to build his own house. Luckily for the sick who couldn't build shelter, a community building was completed on January 19th for shelter and storage. This shelter was critical as death stalked the plantation. On February 17th, they began to implement laws and rules as per the Mayflower Compact. Bradford writes, Met and consulted of law and orders, both for their civil and maybe government, as ye necessity in their situation did require still including thereon too, as pressing occasion in several instances, and as instances did require. Miles Standish, a man with military experience, was selected as the settlement captain for military affairs, supporting John Carver, the plantation, plantation governor elected on the Mayflower. And instances were dire. Death stalked the plantation all winter, Death caused by diseases acquired on the voyage or because of it. Bradford writes, Being inflamed with ye scurvy and different diseases, which this lengthy voyage and their inaccommodate situation had added upon them, so as there died a few times two or three of a day. The Mayflower was delayed in leaving for England because most of the crew was also sick, sick and cared for largely by settlers who remained on the ship. However, the sailors were not willing to help the settlers in any way. One man in the settlement asked the sailors for some beer. Watered beer was one way to stave off scurvy, and the sailors were keeping it all for themselves. The man's request was quickly refused while scurvy continued to plague the land-based settlers. By spring, only 50 of the 105 original settlers still lived. This was not because of starvation. Records show that they had meat to eat due to hunting, but they had no fruit or vegetables. Contrary to what many of us learned in school, the Indians did not help the settlers during that first winter. The new inhabitants of the New World had to fend for themselves, but that doesn't mean the Indians weren't interested in whites taking over the land where our Wampanoag nation had once lived. 
lived well before the arrival of a European-delivered disease that had devastated the village about four years earlier. Delivered by European fishermen, who often killed or otherwise mistreated the Indians, sometimes taking some into slavery. Bradford wrote, All this while, ye Indians came skulking approximately them, and might now and again show themselves. However, while any approached close to them, they could run away. The settlers would occasionally see Indians standing afar off, but the Indians would run off when approached. But they were never far away. If the settlers left tools out in the woods or in the fields where they might be working, many of them would be stolen by the Indians. On March 16th, a naked Indian walked into the settlement speaking broken English, an Indian named Samoset. Samoset had a lot of interactions with English fishermen, resulting in a working knowledge of the settlers' language. Mort's relation reports that He saluted us in English and bade us welcome for he had learned some broken English among the Englishmen that came to fish at Monkigan, he was stark naked, only a leather about his waist, with a fringe about a span long, or little more. He had a bow and two arrows, the one headed, and the other unheaded. He asked some beer, but we gave him strong water and biscuit, and butter, and cheese, and pudding, and a piece of mallard, all which he liked well, and had been acquainted with such amongst the English. He told us the place where we now live is called Patuxet, and that about four years ago, all the inhabitants died of an extraordinary plague. After eat and drink, he left saying he would return. Monhagen is today's Monhagen Island. Five days later, Samoset returned with five companions and the stolen goods. One of the companions was Squanto a native of the village space not now occupied by the settlers. He had been captured and carried to England, where he lived in Cornhill, with a merchant, and learned English. When Squanto returned home, he found his village gone, wiped out by disease. Samoset informed the settlers that his Sackham Massasoit, chief of the Wampanoag, wanted the settlers' leaders to meet with him. Massasoit, who was nearby, asked that the settlers come to him. This they denied. But they sent Winslow to speak with him, to know his mind, and to signify the mind and will of our governor, which was to have trading and peace with him. The Wampanoag, their name meaning people of the first light, or people of the dawn, were a coalition of clans of the Poconocet and some lesser nations, under the Grand Sachem or intertribal chief, Massasoit. They had been the most powerful Indian group in the area until Europeans brought disease that killed most of them, including all of the Patoxet, who occupied the area where the settlers decided to place Plymouth, to use land already cleared by those who were gone. Winslow took a pair of knives and a jeweled copper chain as gifts. Massasoit decided to visit the settlers, leaving Winslow with his brother as what appears to be a hostage to ensure Massasoit's safety. Massasoit entered Plymouth with 20 men who had left their bows and arrows behind. In addition to agreeing to help the settlement, Massasoit quickly agreed to enter into a mutual defense agreement. As Sackham of the Wampanoag, he was struggling to maintain independence for his people, a people who had been almost entirely erased by disease. The Narragansett, a nearby Indian nation, had not been affected by the widespread plague and was strong enough to start pressuring Massasoit to bend the knee. The compact was also a good idea for the settlement, being surrounded by Indians, some of whom had already attacked the exploration team. The agreement also defined the relationship between Plymouth and Wampanoag. Bradford recorded the compact, a document written by the settlers from their perspective which reads, That neither he nor any of his, have to injury or do hurt to any in their people. That if any of his did any hurt to any of theirs, he ought to send ye perpetrator, that they might punish him. That if any element have been taken from any of theirs, he must purpose it to be restored, and that they ought to do ye like to his. If any did unjustly war in opposition to him, they might aid him, 
If any did war in opposition to them, he should aid them. He ought to ship to his neighbors' contracts, to certify them of this, that they may not incorrect them, but might be likewise comprised in ye situations of peace. That whilst their men got here to them, they ought to depart their bows and arrows behind them. Massasoit did his part and worked with the surrounding Indian nations to bring peace for the Wapanag and Plymouth, a peace that lasted over seventy years. When Massasoit left, Squanto stayed in Plymouth. In addition to serving as an interpreter, he also taught the settlers how to farm and fish. Farming consisted of planting corn seed in a mound and using fish as fertilizer. Once the stalks rose on the mounds, beans and squash were also planted on each mound. While corn drains the soil of nutrients, the beans and squash return them. As the weather warmed, the daily deaths in Plymouth subsided. According to Bradford, The spring now drawing clothes, it pleased God the mortality began to end among them, and ye ill and lame recovered apace, which positioned as it have been new lifestyles into them, even though they had borne their sad pain with much staying power and contentedness, as I think any human beings could do. The Mayflower finally departed for England in April. Leaving earlier was not an option while the crew was still sick. Also, some of the settlers still lived on the ship through the winter. In addition to planting corn, the settlers also tried to plant wheat and peas they had brought from Europe, but the Euro European crops did poorly. As Bradford recorded, Some English seed they sow, as wheat and peas, however it got here no longer to properly, either with the aid of ye badness of ye seed, or lateness of ye season, or both, or a few different defect. As they passed their first summer in Plymouth, life improved daily. The crops grew, the fish bit, and peace and collaboration with the Indians continued. Winslow and Stephen Hopkins were sent with gifts to visit Massasoit. Mort's relation lists five reasons for the visit. First, to know where to find Massasoit if needed. To see the strength of the Wapanag. To discover the country. To prevent random visits by numerous Indians who were who the settlers had to feed and gift when appropriate. It was taking a toll on their ability to take care of themselves. They asked Massasite to only allow two or three at a time to visit. To make satisfaction for some conceived injuries done. They wanted to know who the corn belonged to that they had taken when first exploring the Cape. And to continue the league of friendship between Plymouth and the Wapanag. Massasoit agreed to everything, and he was given a slightly laced coat of red cotton. Winslow and Hopkins stayed two days with Massasoit. During their trip, they were treated well by all the Indians, who fed and housed them. A few days later, ten of the settlers traveled to what they called the Kingdom of Nauset. They were looking for a boy who had become lost in the woods. They were also able to pay a debt. As I covered in the last video, the settlers had taken buried corn on two of their exploration trips. They always intended to pay back the Indians for the corn, corn that kept the settlers eating, but deprived the Indians of much of their winter's subsistence. When at Nauset, they met the owner of the corn. As written in Mort's relation, The one being of Monomoyic, and one of those whose corn we had formerly found, we promised him restitution, and desired him to come to Patuxet for satisfaction, or else we would bring them so much corn again. He promised to come, we used him very kindly for the present. They were also successful in retrieving the lost boy. In the autumn, the settlers harvested twenty acres of corn and six, six acres of barley. The peas they planted were not worth the gathering. Bradford wrote, And now began, To our available keep of fowl, as wintry weather approached, of which this area did abound. Once they came first, however in a while reduced by way of ranges. And besides water fowl, they changed into first-rate shop of untamed turkeys of which they took many, besides venison, etc., Besides they'd about a meal a week to a person, or now given that harvest, Indian corn to that proportion. 
which made many afterwards write so largely of their masses listen to their friends in England, which have been not feigned, however genuine reports. This conservative description of the harvest is Bradford's relation of what today we call the first Thanksgiving. However, the description that described Thanksgiving as a big party is found in Mort's relation. Our harvest being gotten in, our governor sent four men on fowling, that so we might, after a special manner, rejoice together after we had gathered the fruit of our labors. They four in one day killed as much fowl as, with a little help beside, served the company almost a week. At which time, amongst other recreations, we exercised our arms, many of the Indians coming amongst us, and among the rest their greatest king Massasoit, with some ninety men, whom for three days we entertained and feasted, and they went out and killed five deer, which they brought to the plantation, and bestowed on our governor, and upon the captain, and others. And although it be not always so plentiful as it was at this time with us, yet by the goodness of God, we are so far from want that we often wish you partakers of our plenty. The first Thanksgiving likely fell someplace between these two descriptions. Given Bradford's conservative reporting and Winslow's optimistic reporting to encourage more settlers to come from England, and given what a day of Thanksgiving meant to the pilgrims. The pilgrims commonly called a day of Thanksgiving when something good happened, or when things overall were going well. This day of thanks was a time of introspection and prayer. If the first harvest Thanksgiving was like the others, it fell short of a raucous party. However, because there were Plymouth residents who were not Calvinists, it's possible that there was some partying going on. We might never know what really happened on the first Thanksgiving, a day that exploded into a national holiday over the decades following. Unlike early at Jamestown settlers, the Plymouth residents worked the land and collaborated with the Indians, a collaboration that resulted in growing success after the first harsh winter. Around the time of the harvest Thanksgiving Day, a ship arrived with 35 more settlers, a group that was just the start of a string of immigrants, including those Puritans who settled Massachusetts, a colony that eventually absorbed Plymouth. As you can see, the topics we'll discuss in this channel will analyze both ancient and current beliefs. There's no correct answer for most of what we cover when we do this. Instead, we explore and come to tentative conclusions based on what we learn while being open to changing our beliefs when additional information becomes available. Please subscribe if you learned something or were challenged by what I covered in this video. Until next time, keep an open mind.